Hi, gentlemen. Um, as a fairly serious meditator, I wanted to uh, ask both of you if you would be willing to recount uh, any particular particular memories from retreat, uh, whether you were sitting or not, um, what kind of practices you were doing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying. It's just recounting memories from retreat seems. Uh, not useful here, but I guess I would say, I mean, we haven't touched the topic much, Yuval. Well, I can, what, I can yeah, just say yeah. about that, that one of the biggest dangers in, in meditation is the pursuit of special experiences. Yeah. That it gets you distracted and sidetracked from the real job, which is getting just to know your mind. Not in a special way, like with fireworks or whatever, but getting to know your annoying, boring, distracted, distractive mind in its most mundane. And, you know, people, they come out of, of, of a, say, one hour sitting of meditation, and they say, oh, I had this great meditation. I was so focused, and everything was so peaceful. And then they come out of an hour, and they, this was a terrible, I, I don't know why I wasted this hour, I was just in wandering thoughts and, and, and whatever. And this is just wrong. I mean, the first thing is to just get to know your mind. So if you sit for one hour with your mind and it's all over the place, that's your mind. So I, I, I would say that um, I don't want to share any special experiences of, of meditation. I'll share this. I sit for one hour and my mind is all over the place. <laughs> I guess I would add that there's a, an additional point that explains the logic of not caring about special experiences because the goal of meditation is not to get more and more peak experiences even though people are readily misled by the, their peak experiences. So if the first time you meditate and it seems to be, quote, working because you have a highly non-ordinary experience, you start out not even realizing how distracted you are, then you, get, you meditate a little more and you, then you realize your mind is completely out of control. But then if you persist, you begin to have these experiences where you touch real concentration and that, the signature of that tends to be some very pleasant changes in what it's like to be you, right, in the nature of your experience. And then you begin to associate those transient changes with success in meditation. But... The real goal, paradoxically, is to notice certain things about totally ordinary consciousness that are liberating in a, a deep sense. And this is where psychedelics have been incredibly useful for many of us, but this is where there's a disanalogy between psychedelic experience and meditative experience, because with psychedelic experience, the point is the pyrotechnics on some level. I mean, if you take acid and nothing happens, well, you're going to fire your chemist, right? <laughs> but the center of the bullseye meditatively is recognizing certain things about the nature of ordinary consciousness, which, are, which don't, get, they don't get freer of self when you add the pyrotechnics of the, of the sort that you experience in a psychedelic experience or that you can experience in so-called peak experiences in meditation. Because again, anything that comes, it goes. And what you're really looking for with meditation is something intrinsic to the nature of consciousness that you can rely on as a foundation for well-being no matter what's happening, you know, before anything changes. You know, is there a way to feel the sadness you've been feeling for the last 10 minutes to suddenly recognize it as an appearance in consciousness that is okay. Your well-being in that moment isn't predicated on somehow getting rid of the thing that is there, you know, physiologically or, or perceptually or as a matter of concepts. Anyway, that's, that's a memory of a past retreat. This question is mostly for Sam since, uh, you, I mean, you both have a lot of experience with meditation, but given your background in neuroscience, I was wondering mm -hmm. to what extent do you think that the maximum amount of benefit someone can get from meditation is dictated strictly by their particular neuroanatomy, and how, if at all, could we go about potentially testing for that scientifically? 
Well, it, my opinion on this isn't born of the current neuroscience. I mean, we, we are testing this neuroscientifically, and there's, there's a, now a fair amount of data on meditation and how the far outliers differ at, at the level of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology from people who just, who, who are novices. I mean, so they take people who have learn to meditate in, in, in a paradigm over eight weeks and compare them to, to controls who are not meditating at all, but then they compare those people to people who have spent 10 or 20 or even 50,000 hours in meditation, and there are, are differences that have been characterized, but I think you can understand the benefits of it without worrying about where you or anyone else sits on the spectrum of talent or you know good luck with respect to whatever whatever the the variables are that dictate someone's abilities there i mean it's a little it's a little bit like physical exercise i mean we we know physical exercise is good for you wherever you are on the spectrum of genetic gifts and environmental auspiciousness right so even if you're in prison in solitary confinement for your misdeeds and you've got bad genes right we know that it would be good for you to exercise for a variety of reasons. You'd feel better, you'd be healthier, you'd just, it's just, and even if you have certain injuries that you have to work around, so it's not straightforward to say, well, you know, this, this specific exercise is good for you because you're, you know, you've got a bum shoulder, say. There's still a workaround and there's this general principle that it's kind of a use it or lose it principle to your physical body and, and exercise is a, a net good for almost anyone in any situation. And there is, there is that component with meditation. It's not like, I mean, there are people who have various psychological conditions where you certainly wouldn't say, go on silent retreat for a month. This is going to be the, the greatest month of your life, right? There are people who shouldn't do that. But it is just a fact that most of our suffering, you know, if not all of our you know, real suffering, is the product of us being lost in a story we're telling ourselves you know, about, about what just happened or what will happen. I mean, all of our anxiety and our regret and our self-concern and uh, you know, just, just the, the fact that we are, we're in a dream. We're, most of us are in a dream, a waking dream, every moment of our lives. And, and unless you're, you're especially lucky, this dream has a, has a negative character much, if not most of the time. And part of this dream is trying to find reasons that are good enough to just surrender to the present moment and locate your well-being here. If you could line up all the variables, you know, it's, it's, it's your birthday and all your friends are coming over and you're, you know, you've got your health and you've got your wealth and you've been looking forward to this for, for a month and planning it and everyone shows up and the food is right, and the drinks are right. You've been looking forward to this, and you're, getting, you're gathering all the variables together, and then you just, presumably, that's a moment where you can say, aha, this is it, the present moment is good enough, and yet, as a matter of our attention, we're always missing the present moment because we're finding something that's not quite right, we're, we're talking to ourselves, we can, we're struggling to even understand what our best friend is saying to us because our mind is wandering, we haven't trained our minds in any way that allows us to finally arrive in the present. And extreme cases aside, virtually everyone benefits from being able to notice the difference between being lost in thought and being simply aware of the sensory emotional display in consciousness in, in the present, right? Just, just, just being able to, if, until you've noticed that distinction, and this, this distinction goes by the name of mindfulness, until you notice that there's an option to break the spell of, your, of the conversation you're having with yourself and just be present, you are by definition a hostage of whatever thoughts are going to come all day long. And when you see how thoughts derange your life, you know, angry thoughts make you angry, and then you say angry things, and then you're the angry guy in relationship with people who now no longer like you, right? And all of the consequences play out. It is an, it's a superpower to be, to be given a choice to just not be angry in the next moment, right? Just to notice, let that thought go and let that, this cascade of you know, the neurophysiological signature of anger just go. We need not await the deliverances of a future science of the mind that tells us exactly what the differences are between people that account for differences here and, and why it's good for us or, or not. It's 
it is a lot like exercise. And, you know, 100 years ago, we knew exercise was good for us without knowing the physiology. So that, uh, I'm sorry how, that that was as long-winded as it was, but um, we're now past the point of, of no return. I have to say good night to all of you. Uh, this, please thank you all for showing up. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes.